Hello everyone and welcome to Harv's World for another episode of Pineapple Bay. I'm sure you can see I'm not at home, <laughs> but it is early in the morning, 7.30. This is Elizabeth's house. Enough said. <laughs> or as she prefers to be called, Elizabeth. And uh, yeah, she's been a real interesting contact, need I say more. But... <laughs> I've got to get back home and get to work. Actually, I need to uh, get right here in this field. She just lives down the road a little ways, but next to my uh, my secondary field here, the the previous cotton field. And as you can see, the oilseed radish has grown just enough that we can turn that into fertilizer, and I think should be able to get lucky enough I'm just gonna pull off here and yeah I mean I always get my equipment set up and ready for running at least I try to but because I've still got cotton left in that baler and it did provide some good cash even on the crappy field that I had to work with the last time we're gonna try cotton again for no other reason to get that last bale out. It is good money. And what I want to do is just run a couple passes on the end rows here. And then I'm going to throw a worker on this bad boy and get him going. And then there's other work to be done. But, so it's been a few days since we were last together and one I placed an order with the shop and from what I've been told that ship is in this morning very important order it's going to start to moving my little plan forward a little bit slowly but surely and then I've got oats ready to be harvested while the oil seed was growing The oats came in so I want to get that taken care of today now there's one minor problem with the oats not a problem a, more of a blessing than a problem <laughs> but uh, there's gonna be straw and I need that straw because these horses that my aunt picked up are uh, running out of their bedding material so I need to get that straw over to them and put some in storage now uh, there's only a couple of horses so I think in order to get some more money coming in what I'm gonna do is sell off most of those oats but we'll see how many we have I think if I keep around 10,000 liters in the silo just to keep those horses going I'll be okay that's my only concern at the moment. Keeping those horses working. Man, that is a rough patch right through there. I have to remember that that's there. And I'm just going to run down to the other end take care of this. Anyway, I was talking to Elizabeth last night. I, I guess you could kind of say she's my new girlfriend. <laughs> hey, something good has to come out of this island. I mean, a lot of good's coming out of the island, but... Um, anyway, she's been around for a long time. She knew my aunt, actually. They were actually uh, pretty good friends. I don't think in the same way we are friends, but who knows? You never can tell. Anyway, not my business. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, Elizabeth's been around here. For, Elizabeth's been around here for a long, long time. She knows everybody. She's uh, introduced me to a few people, and it seems like all the farmers have the same frustrations, and that is, you know, the government control over everything, um, the, the restrictions on on equipment and whatnot. So apparently. Now, she didn't come right out and say this, and I don't know if it's true or not for sure, but I'm speculating here. 
that the farmers have kind of banded together and there's a bit of a black market working on this island. So it might be possible at some point to get some equipment that isn't necessarily available due to the government restrictions. I'm not pressing the issue. I'm, you know, I'm going to wait for her to build up that level of trust that she feels like I can, uh, I can be trusted to uh, take advantage of their little smuggling operation, if that's what you want to call it. Hey, why wouldn't there be farmer smugglers on Pineapple Bay? I mean, this was Pirate's Bay, right? So we've got farmer pirates, or pirate farmers, or <laughs> whatever you want to call them. Either way, the concept is pretty darn cool. The pirates remain on Pineapple Bay. Outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. All right, let's see if this worker will just jump right in here and start uh, throwing down my cotton for me. There we go. Looks good looks real good now the next plan of action is going to be to get my big field 35 harvested up that's what I got to do next so let me grab my ooh, grab my pickup truck get back over to the farm and start working working that field because that's going to be make for a long day but, the other thing is, um, I told Elizabeth that my ants equipment was really limited, you know, and she knows, she's been over enough that she knows uh, what my aunt was up against, and, and she basically told me, yeah, you know, the farming part of it, my aunt had already made her money, it had kind of just been put aside so she had some of these big fields but she wasn't doing much with them and that's kind of why we've got this small equipment so it's going to be up to me to get all of this uh, squared away and whatnot and to advance this farm which is perfectly fine obviously I've got no problem with that whatsoever But, we are going to give this harvester a break-in. Now, actually, I did give it a break-in. I picked up, because Elizabeth was uh, introducing me around and, and all of that, I did pick up a contract to harvest a small field. So that brought in a little bit of extra money, which is good. God knows I need it. And she introduced me to her nephew, who has a massive field. But I agreed to go over there and cultivate his field, and that brought in another about fifteen thousand. Um, between harvesting the smaller field, which was still ten acres, I mean, there's nothing small around here, nothing small at all. But between harvesting that small field and bringing in or uh, cultivating her nephew's field. I managed to uh, pick up about another, oh, $30,000 or so. So that did bring in some decent money. Um, now, I did place that order with the shop. Again, that equipment has come in, so I need to run down and pick that up today, and that's really going to advance the farm. So I'm definitely, definitely looking forward to that. And I'm sitting here talking about I need straw. And I don't have my... There we go, that's better. My swather turned on. 
Anyway, back to Elizabeth. So, I told her I need straw for the horses. She didn't have any. She doesn't keep any. She doesn't have any animals. But she did have an old piece of equipment sitting around on one of her farms that she said she could loan me. Just for the day. So I need to go over and run over and try to find that also. If I can find out where she... Uh, I think I know the general area now, but I think I'll be able to find that. Hopefully I can find that. So yeah, there is plenty to get done today. Look at that beast of a field. <laughs> I just keep thinking about how much tiny equipment I've got and how massive this field is, and I know I need to do something about it, but right now it is what it is. As long as I can make some money off of it, I just have to do work the hard way. And that's what I'll do. Because Pirate's Bay Farm will succeed. And, well, my primary goal here is rum. I want to produce that rum. And we are going to start that process today. Of that you can be sure. No question, no doubt about it. The rum process begins today. We are not wasting any time. And it was no small expenditure, let me tell you, what I've done to, uh, to get this started. But it's going to be a necessary expenditure and, not only that, It's going to uh, pretty much ensure the future of rum production. It's going to be something I'll be using quite frequently, I believe. I'm sure it will be quite frequently. And Pirate's Bay Farm will put its name on the map. Oh yes. Now my aunt has a bit of a legacy here on this island. But we're going to advance that legacy all over the world. That's my goal. That's my plan. I'm sure there will be setbacks from time to time. But for today, Step one begins. Now something that's interesting about this island, and uh, I'm kind of intrigued by the possibility, but so in the Caribbean, one of the primary agricultural crops is sugarcane. Actually, I'm, I'm a little bit intrigued by the fact that there are so many cereal crops and such being grown down here because most of the islands grow things like coffee, tobacco, bananas is a big one, really big one, um, and sugarcane is huge. And I think the government here has pretty much just, you know, tried to find new agricultural solutions, especially to uh, feed the people on this island. So they haven't focused as much on exports. Like I said, you know, this is a, a new government that's formulating down here, but it's still agriculturally operating old school. So, you know... In the last few years, agriculture has opened up, but it's not fully open yet. Because previously, it was all run by the government. Everything was owned by the government. So, you know, the, the people who worked in farming, and this, this could be another reason that my aunt's farm had fallen off in recent years, you know, because if you were farming, you were doing it to sustain the population. 
Now she made her money. She found ways to make money and, and to uh, obviously do fairly well financially. And especially in the last few years, she's made some serious investments. Like I said, here's we're coming up on the biogas plant right here. Well, she had she had made some serious investments right here. So she was doing okay for herself, even in this somewhat repressive government. But still, certain crops have fallen off. And one of the primary exports around the Caribbean is sugarcane. Now it just so happens. It just so happens that one of the things we're going to need for my rum is sugarcane. Now the recipe said sticks of the cane. So that pretty much is unprocessed sugarcane, right? Right. That's my expectation, anyway. So, with that said, I need to run back up to the house. That's not what I want. I need to grab a truck and a trailer, because this is obviously going to fill up very quickly. There we go. So I think it might be time to bring sugarcane production back to this area of the Caribbean. You would think in producing goods for your own people, even if you're not exporting, sugar would have been kind of an important one. But apparently, it wasn't on their priority list. Well. It's going to kind of have to become on my priority list, so I need to do some research. I need to look into it, find out what equipment I can get my hands on. I'm sure it's going to be an expensive proposition. So that's going to be one of the final steps in my process of uh, getting this rum recipe going. It's going to be getting sugar cane in the field, which means I need to get the equipment together to do it. There we go. I would say this is probably going to be a pretty good oat harvest on this field. Even with the weedy patch, it's not going to be as good out in the weedy patch that we didn't get taken care of, but... I expect this field is going to do quite well. Very well indeed, actually. In fact... I'm probably going to end up with so much bloody straw off of this field that I'm going to just end up selling a bunch of it anyway. That's my guess. We'll see. Like I said, I've only got the two horses for now, but... And I discovered this last night, too. No, not last night. It was yesterday I discovered this before last night, if you know what I mean. But, uh... One of those horses is pregnant. And it looks like we're probably going to have a colt here in a few days. So that will be a very, very good thing. Because horses from this area sell for good money. So if I can get these horses raised up, that will help bring some money into the farm. And with a little bit of luck, we'll just keep breeding new horses. Raise them up, train them up, and then sell them off. So, I don't know. I think we've got a pretty positive plan 
in place, ready to go. We're at the very beginnings, the bare bones beginnings. Still trying to get this farm in order. But it's going to happen. It is truly, truly going to happen. I'm feeling positive. I'm feeling good about it. Making some connections. Getting the work done, even though, good God, the work takes a long time because of this equipment. But, hey, it is what it is. We are going to get there, and that's what really matters. field is still working <laughs> but it's getting late in the day well it's afternoon already those oats are still coming off i got about two-thirds of the way done but i figured i'd better get over to the new cotton field and check on my worker he finished up but you never know it said he was dead well we're gonna find out That's not good. Our bloody weeds are coming in already. This field has barely been planted and it's loaded with weeds already. That, that is not cool. Okay, well, we're not gonna let happen to us <laughs> what happened the last time. So I need to go grab that weeder and another tractor. Okay, here we go. Hold that bad boy. I'll do the exact same thing I did with my seating. Get some headlands knocked out here. At least the weeding goes quicker. So hopefully this time 
since I'm getting on it early. I'll be able to take care of these weeds and then they won't uh, cause a problem with my cotton harvest the next time. And this guy's field is in bad shape too. Look at all those weeds. And luckily, it doesn't take much to pull a weeder across the ground. So this little tractor is kind of perfectly suited to this, uh, this job. Alright, that's one end done. Give my worker some room to work. Oh, that horrible patch. Always forget about that. I don't want to muck around with it too much, though, because I'll end up having to recreate this field, and I don't want to do that either. I don't know if Elizabeth's home this afternoon. I could sneak in for a quick bit. No, I don't have time for that. <laughs> I don't have time. i got work to do. Harp. Harp. Focus on the task at hand. Focus on plucking your weeds. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to focus on plucking my weeds. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to worry about Elizabeth. I got my own fish to fry at the moment. Oh, well, running downhill, this thing's not bad. It's nice and quiet. <laughs> it's when you have to force the engine that it really gets uh, nuts on you. Okay. Mr. Helper, I need you to get busy on this field right about now. Right about here. Come on. go all right very nice very nice indeed go grab my tractor get this planter back up to the farm and then I'm gonna take this tractor and drive right on down to the shop and pick up that new equipment that came off the boat this morning so I think if I'm smart and nobody really ever accuses me of that too often. <laughs> but what I will do is run this back to the farm, drop it off, and I'll see you at the shop. Here we go. Here we go. And there it is, right there, sitting right out in front. They got it all set up and ready to go for me. Outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. So, I'm going to hook up to this bad boy, and I get the feeling, I don't get the feeling, I know, because uh, they bought, I bought this used, sight unseen. They had a connection, they, they hooked me up, I told them what I wanted, and luckily there's no, uh, no restrictions on these tree planters but I told them I was going to plant a whole lot of trees and they uh, had no problem with that whatsoever so that's good at least so as you can see I've got a rig here that's going to going to plant up multiple trees but I think I'm going to bring it over to the shop check it out 
can see exactly what it's going to take to uh, make sure these are functioning 110% because I'm going to have a lot of trees, and I mean a lot of trees to plant. Might as well get my tractor fixed up while I'm here. Oh yeah, these are in bad shape. I'm going to repair that. Uh, even, the, even the rig is uh, beat up. All right, much better, much better indeed. And just like with any other tree planter, we're just going to get up next to our pallets, like so. And each of these pallets holds 50, 50 trees. I think this will be easier if I uh, yep. spread them out like so. Why does this one want to be stubborn? There we go. Okay. Quick run back up to the home, the farm. And uh, we'll plant some trees. I'll see you up there. Okay, so I wasn't really going back to the farm per se. I need to come back down here by field 44 because this is where I've got some space to plant some trees. And this is going to be my spot right here. Okay, so all I should have to do is open this thing up like so. Now I think I could plant these closer together. Fold it up, but I don't see that being my best option. I kind of feel like if they get too close together they are going to uh, not thrive the way I would like to. So we're going to turn these planters on like so. And I should just be able to drop it down. Oh, no, no, I need that. Drop it down. Oh, yeah, and they automatically put the first tree in the ground. And we just run a nice straight shot right across here. Very nice. Very nice indeed. None of this planting one tree at a time business. Three trees, baby. see where it plants the last one because I don't want to get close to my field. I'm not going to block myself off from that. Looks like two more plantings. One there and this is probably going to be right at the end. Uh, I'm tempted to try to put one more row in there but nope I'm not going to do it. In fact I think I'll start about right here. Maybe just a smidge closer. Yep, probably about like that. Now those are right on the edge. That's as close to field 44 as I want these trees to be. My workers have a hard enough time getting around without uh, <laughs> without trees in their way. We all know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a few trees around here we might be able to take out. There's a couple right in front of me. They're small. Well, we'll see. We shall see. Probably could have gotten those just a little bit closer together. Oh, that planted right on the edge. You see that? You can almost see it. Barely. Outstanding, absolutely outstanding. I think I'm going to start at the other end again. That seemed to work out better. That way I can make sure that my row of trees is where I want it to be and uh, nowhere else.
I like how it just pops the first tree in right where you uh, you set down. Okay, this little spot might just take up every bit of these trees. I've already planted 75. one more out down here yep excellent very nice very nice indeed got some really good spacing working here too that's nice I like it I like it Yep, just about right there. Drop her down. She pops a tree in the ground, and then we just cruise right on. My helper in his full green tank. <laughs> now, I'm going to have a little narrow section here, real close to the biogas plant. I definitely want to try to get a couple more rows in there. I think I know how to manage that. So if I squeeze this thing back together like so. Turn off the middle one like so. my way in right about here and yeah this time this time I will just start on this end no there we go so if I drop this down yep working like a charm That'll just get me two more extra rows of trees in here. I almost feel like I could have got that third row in, but that's getting a little close to the fence. Don't want to risk it. Oh, I got workers finishing up all over the place. Outstanding. Well... There we go. A hundred and got eleven, twelve. Geez, a hundred and thirty six trees in that little spot. How outstanding is that? That is remarkable in a very short amount of time. I'm going to dig the tree planter, let me tell you, that's pretty slick. So instead of talking about, now we talked about Mary Reed so far, and we talked about. Calico Jack Rackham. And Jack Rackham is linked to Charles Vane. Well, Charles Vane is an interesting character, but we're not going to talk about him today. We are going to talk about something he was associated with, and that is the Republic of Pirates. And this is all centered around the Bahamas. The Republic of Pirates was all about the Bahamas, um, Nassau in particular. And what's interesting about this is that, you know, if you've watched any pirate movies, even, even the Johnny Depp version, even they talk about this, and it's the Pirate Code. There really was such a thing as the Pirate Code, and it was created, or at least really used at the Republic of Pirates which was Nassau in the Bahamas and it was a 
a full-blown city that had been taken over by the pirates and they put their own person in charge and that just happened to be Edward Teach now he goes by many names Edward Teach he was sometimes called Edward Thatch but the one you probably know him best by was Blackbeard now the Republic of Pirates being what it was was reasonably lawless but they still had their own code and what happened was so in late 1600s about 1696 um, a pirate named Henry Every brought his ship known as the Fancy into Nassau Harbor and he bribed the governor the governor's name was Nicholas Trot. Um, he gave the governor pretty much all the gold and silver he wanted. Plus, he even turned over his ship. He gave the governor his ship. So, it kind of became a lawless place. Good lord, that's annoying. <laughs> that is one obnoxious tractor. I do see we've got our first growth on this field. You know what that means? That means we can get our rollers down here. We can get our rollers down here and uh, get the soil compacted so that uh, we can uh, get our fertilizer working on that field. <coughs> So anyway, Henry Every bribed the governor, and uh, this established Nassau as a place where pirates could operate out of freely, which is important. I mean, you know, you can't be on a ship all the time. If you go into port in a respectable city, well, you're likely to get imprisoned. There's a good chance you'll be imprisoned. And... Uh, so Nassau in the Bahamas now became a pirate haven. Now governors changed hands, blah blah blah, but they, you know, they always blew smoke up the British crown's patootie. <laughs> you know, they they made a show of capturing pirates or trying to ward off piracy or fighting off piracy or whatever. But uh, it was just a show because, of course, these governors are getting rich, and they're getting rich because of the pirates. Now, the pirates didn't attack. They didn't take over anything. What they did do, however... Oh, my God, i got to get it up. This tractor is deafening me. Go away. Give me a good tractor. Um... You know, they had a good thing going. They're just throwing in some bribes here and there every once in a while. These governors are getting wealthy. And when it's all said and done, the uh, everybody's having a good day. Well, suddenly Nassau becomes, starts getting attacked by uh, a Franco-Spanish fleet. It attacked him twice in 1703 and 1706. And so most of the settlers in Nassau abandoned abandoned the city. They just said, nah, um, you guys aren't doing anything to keep these attacks from happening. We're out of here. Which pretty much means the British set sail and turn tail and got the heck out of there well without the British government there to uh, manage things guess who decided that it was time to take over if you guessed the pirates you would be absolutely correct so at this point Nassau is in the hands of pirates it you know it was their safe haven to begin with now it was the Republic of Pirates.
And like I said, Blackbeard was the first one they put in charge. So, now they were free to sail in and out of Nassau. They could attack whomever they wanted. Now, if you don't know anything about pirates, especially in the golden age of piracy, pirates became pirates, or the piracy and its, you know, the, the mythology around piracy that, that we kind of know and love, um, started up with what was known as privateering. And what privateering was, was that captains of ships would be given what are known as letters of mark by a government to ward off their enemies. So, for example, let's say England was at war with Spain. And if you're an English captain of a ship, the crown would grant you what's known as a letter of mark, M-A-R-Q-U-E. And what this letter of mark did was say, under the authority of the British Crown, you have the right to attack our enemies. In this case, in our example, would be the French. Those rollers actually do a really nice job of, of getting that soil the way it needs to be. That's pretty slick. I like that. They're different, you know. Anyhow, A lot of these guys would end up getting a letter of mark from multiple nations. You know, well, I'm an English privateer, but I'm going to go to France and say, hey, you know, I've got a ship. If you want me to attack England, then give me your letter of mark. You know, they, they, they kind of became um, a little bit lawless to begin with. They were, they were double-sided, a little bit lacking in loyalty. Now, I'm not saying all of them did this. Obviously, not all of them did, but, you know, it was these disreputable guys that eventually became the pirates. And, I'm sure, privateering was making them quite wealthy. So, with that said, they're out there doing whatever they want. And, you know, they're attacking these ships, they're bringing home the spoils, they're turning them over to the crown, but then they get a nice big fat commission. Well, they got a taste for blood. And, effectively, started attacking everybody. And that's when they turned into pirates. And so... You know, if England now suddenly decides to have a treaty with France and say, hey, you know, we're, we're tired of this war, we want it to end, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna create a treaty. Well, now England has to do something about the people who hold their letters of mark. They have to uh, sh make a show of getting rid of them, so now they're hunting pirates the pirates that they effectively had created. But I mean, it's on all sides. The French, the Spanish, the English, um, everybody had been granting letters of mark. This was common practice in the day and age when a nation couldn't afford its own, or not afford, but couldn't build as strong a navy as fast as they would like. And the British Navy was powerful, and they were feared. But they still needed help, because why wouldn't you get help? I mean, to this day, governments hire mercenaries to fight for them if they need the extra help. So, you know, this is not a new practice. That is pretty darn slick. I could get a few more of these rollers, maybe. <laughs> Hmm. 
They're a little bit unwieldy, so I think going wider than three might might be a bit of a challenge, but I do like the way they're operating. Nice and simple. And there were many, many famous pirates that were operating out of Nassau, including guys like Sam Bellamy and Steed Bonnet or Steed Bonnet. I'm not sure how his name is pronounced. Um, Charles Vane. Um, there were a couple others. Um, Benjamin Hornigold and Henry Jennings were another couple of uh, famous pirates. In fact, um, Hornigold and Jennings were bitter enemies, I suppose. Well, I don't suppose. It's recorded that they were bitter enemies. And in fact, they are responsible for creating many of the, the famous pirates. They, they kind of... Uh, kind of became mentors, if you will, teaching these guys the ropes. And Jennings is known for, um, like, mentoring Charles Vane, who we've talked about, um, and Jack Rackham, Calico Jack, and Mary Reed, and Anne Bonnie. So all these names start tying together, which is really, really intriguing. And then uh, Hornigold, well, Hornigold was responsible for creating Blackbeard and Sam Bellamy and Steed Bonnet or Steed Bonnet. So, you know, these two guys are responsible, directly responsible for some of the, the most famous pirates in pirate lore, which is impressive because there are quite a few impressively famous pirates in pirate lore. And all of this came out of the Republic of Pirates out of Nassau in the Bahamas. Ultimately, Woods Rogers, who we talked about before, he was brought in to suppress the pirates and was basically responsible for the downfall of the Republic of Pirates and retaking the Bahamas. So, they had it good for a while. They had it good for a good long while. Um, probably from about 1705 to about 1718. So, about 13 years during the Golden Age of Piracy where they were kicking butt and taking names and nobody was in their way. They had their own government. They had their own place to call home. And uh, they were living large. And this is why we know them to this day. But at this point, as you can see, I still have a lot of work to do and it's already two in the afternoon. Going to finish up getting that oat field harvested. We have our trees planted, which is outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. Um, got a good start. Phase one. Phase one of the Pirates Bay Rum begins. And that was getting those trees planted. Oh, and I need to go see about picking up uh, Elizabeth's piece of equipment see about getting that straw off the field that's going to be an interesting task all by itself not going to be pretty <laughs> I can tell because I'm sure there's going to be a metric ton of it anyway I hope you enjoyed this episode of Pineapple Bay or what will lovingly be referred to from now on as Pirates Bay if you did do me a favor, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. I very much appreciate you coming along for the ride. And until next time, take care. <laughs>